Joining me now is Sir Michael Duncan, former UK Foreign Minister. Uh, very good evening to you, Sir Alan. Now, what do you make of this? Uh, is you, you know the Foreign Office very well. Is the building and the people around it and its general demeanour stuck in the past? I'm feeling I'm about to be abolished because I'm elitist and rooted in the past. This is a, a, a very dangerous recommendation. Um, I, I, I think some of the report is good. I, I, I think um, you know, the word abolish is, is silly because obviously there has to be continuity in the government department. And I think there's nothing wrong with the name, the Foreign Office, or I mean, I, I'd have just kept it as the Foreign Office, not necessarily the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. But um, I, I think that some of the recommendations are inevitably those that come with any report like better change the curtains and give it a new image. What I don't agree with uh, is the use of the word elitist. I mean, I think what you want is excellence. You do want specialism. You do want experience. And you need to know about the past in order to make good judgments about the present. So I think some of the recommendations have gone slightly awry. But where I think they are right is they say you've got to have a proper idea of where you're standing is in the world in order not to look boastful and therefore unrealistic. So in that sense, uh, I do agree with that recommendation. So in other words, you agree with the... They seem to say that we slightly puff our chest up too much and we think, you know, we're a little bit big for our boots. Yes, I, I think that's right. And, you know, we're always going on... I mean, this is politicians rather than the Foreign Office using boastful language about how, well, you know, we're leading the world, we're the best in the world. You know, for goodness sake, you know, just, just get real and realise that we're a strong, uh, capable, upper medium-sized power. And we don't need to boast all the time about being the best. But we do need to do what we um, have always done very well. I think we've always had good intellectual integrity. I think we've had honesty in our uh, foreign affairs. Um, but we do need elegant embassies. I, as a minister, I was always against selling embassy buildings, because if you don't have, you know, proper stature in the country where you're trying to wield influence, you won't have much influence to wield. You can't do it out of a porter cabin. So that leads you to an issue that I have not seen mentioned in the report, which is that of resources. You can't do it on tuppence halfpenny. You know, you do need money and you need, and I didn't see this either, a good, sensible career progression so that the right people uh, can be advanced in the right way and that they are people of high quality and are given good direction. And one of the other elements of the report that interested me was the suggestion that the Foreign Office is pretty much run as a private office for the Foreign Secretary rather than taking a big, broad look at the, you know, at the big picture of foreign policy. Well, I think this is a very good point, uh, but it's not so much a point about the Foreign Office as such. It's a point about the political direction it's given and the political culture which it has to obey. So I think that our foreign policy can only be as good as the intellectual quality and authority of the policy that's drawn up by politicians. And the sort of day-to-day -day administration and judgments of the Foreign Office, which ultimately are those directed by ministers, is only as good as those ministers. And we've had so many people coming into the Foreign Office, they're a minister for two minutes and off they go again. I and mean, we, we've had a, as many ministers from the Middle East as we've had, I don't know, whatever it is. I mean, <laughs> one, no, two a year at this rate. Uh, and therefore you never bed down and build relationships because in the end, when you're in a negotiation and you need to you know, get a hostage released or a trade deal done or some kind of agreement that, where you need cooperation or you have a bit of an argument, you need relationships where ministers face to face know their counterparts and are seen as people of authority. And that, I think, has been diminishing, um, much improved, by the way, by the arrival of David Cameron. But otherwise, we've had a very weak series of ministers and it's been very difficult, I think, for the Foreign Office properly to um, uh, exercise its influence. I might come back to David Cameron in a minute, but you mentioned, Sir Alan, um, trade deals there. And of course, one thing that the Foreign Office has done recently is it's, it's 
merged with uh, overseas development so that that can be brought in. But what it hasn't done, and I think this is in the report, is a suggestion that maybe trade deals should be taken away from the business department, which is Kemi Badenoch's area at, at the moment, or and, and should be brought into the Foreign Office so that the Foreign Office is looking you know, to have those diplomatic ties, but also those business and investment ties. Would that make sense? Or does that make it all a bit too big and unwieldy? No, it does make sense. I mean, I was always in favour of the Department of International Trade being folded into the Foreign Office. I was not in favour of uh, development being folded in because I thought it's a separate field of expertise. But now that it has been amalgamated, and of course development doesn't really have much of a budget anymore, I think all of these three things can happen together because essentially they are about international outreach and relationships. And in all of them, you're probably dealing with the same sort of ministers in the host countries where you have your embassy and your uh, foreign office team. So uh, I think that would have been better than keeping a separate um, international trade uh, department. I mean, I think one strong foreign um, facing uh, department is, is a good thing. Yeah. But I say again, it's only as good as the quality of the policy and uh, political leadership they're given. Absolutely. And, and the other thing that I was interested in this report, Sarah, was where they said that actually a lot of the attention and focus from the Foreign Office is stuck in the past. In other words, they're really focused on uh, being close to our European allies and being close to the United States. And actually, I haven't really worked out that we need to be closer to uh, countries in Asia and Africa. Yes, I'm not sure quite what they meant by saying that it's stuck in the past. I mean, you know, we do have a history and we need to know our history in order properly to make decisions uh, in the present. And for instance, you know, knowledge of, of treaties and uh, past history of the countries in which we're engaged uh, matters. So you've got to know about the past because not everything is just day to day stuff. I think. The point, though, was quite interesting when they said it, it's become the sort of uh, too much the private office of ministers. I think what they really mean is that uh, too much of it is directed sort of from the hip by the foreign secretary, whoever that foreign secretary is. And there isn't enough strength of advice. Um, and I think some of this comes from the diminution of the career progression and uh, expertise and authority at the top and therefore around ministers. So um, I, I'm, I'm slightly puzzled about what they were saying about this, but I, I'm, I'm going to think about it a bit more. And David Cameron, Lord Cameron, uh, as he is now, of course, has uh, been thrust into the job with a huge overflowing in tray. We know he's off to Washington uh, in the next few days to talk to the Republican Party about trying to change uh, their attitude to um, helping uh, Ukraine in their fight against Russia. Um, and also, of course, he's been very involved with diplomatic efforts uh, in the Middle East. Do you think, well... I'd love to know from where you sit, um, how, you know, how could he achieve more given the way the world is at the moment? Well, I think he's achieving more than any foreign secretary has for a long time. He's brought much needed authority uh, to our international relations and to uh, the government in general. So I mean, it's always very difficult uh, for any government and foreign office to have the bandwidth to deal with more than one crisis at once. And of course, we've got Gaza, uh, we've got Ukraine, uh, we have uh, difficulty in Yemen and Somalia. You know, these are a lot of things to be handling at once. And when you put them in the mix with a very, very hectic travel program, a schedule where, you know, you're forever on a plane and hardly have time to think, it's a lot to ask of anybody. So, I it actually illustrates the point you were just making, or the report did, that too much of it probably rests uh, with the Foreign Secretary. And we don't have enough authority in the junior ministers. And one of the problems is, certainly with permanent secretaries I had, they just ignore junior ministers and they just suck up the Foreign Secretary. Well, that is an institutional problem, uh, which I think um, diminishes the scope and, and I think energy of, of Foreign Office. And would I change its name? I don't think so, really. I mean, you know, it, it, it's not. This is not a sort of marketing company. 
Uh, we've got to have a flash logo. I've got no objection to good traditional pictures and a traditional building. It's what they think and do that matters. And I think if you keep the elegance and dignity, that can enhance anything we can do, which we might amend as policy for the modern world. All right. Well, I think we will uh, move on now. But I like that idea of um, keeping the elegance and dignity. Fine words from Sir Alan Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us this evening.